Based in Sydney, Australia, Milan Turban works as a senior consultant in the Climate Solutions Department of Pangolin Associates. She is a certified life cycle assessment practitioner who completed a Masters of Engineering at the University of Technology of Compiègne. Milan went on exchange at the National Technical University of Athens in Greece and the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Ms. Turban worked across the solar and water treatment industry for two years before switching to climate consulting. With a special interest in public education and regeneration, Ms. Turban volunteers with Climate Fresk, running climate change workshops, and Region Sydney, implementing circular economy frameworks. Her current key interest is in regeneration, starting on a local scale. Hi everyone, thank you for coming today. I'm calling from the land and water of the Gay Magal people today and pay my respect to the elders of the past who have cared for the land and water for hundreds of years, um, as well as to the one of the present and the future who are protecting it and sharing their wisdom with all of us. Um, so my intention with this presentation today is to foster initiatives toward a new water paradigm in our society to ensure water prosperity at all scales. Um, so I studied chemical engineering and all kinds of industrial water treatment processes. However, it was only a few years ago that I came across a really simple question raised by my first water mentor, Bhakti. And she asked me, where is your water coming from? And where is your water going after you use it? And the first response was that I didn't know. Uh, I just opened a tap and I get potable water flowing through it, I flush the toilet and it goes away, bringing back clean water. And I guess that's the case for many of us. But the question pinched my curiosity and I embarked on a lifelong water literacy journey, which I quickly wanted to share with others around me because water is life. So we needed to, to sustain ourselves. So today I will present an overview of the water challenges we are facing and explain their interconnection. And then we'll approach those challenges as an opportunity to change our relationship with water by introducing the new water paradigm and example of uh, regenerative hydrology projects at different scales. So before diving into the challenges, let's just introduce some facts and number of where is water on Earth. So it may remind you some of your studies or courses on, on water cycle at schools. So this is an example of a water cycle diagram, but please keep in mind that it doesn't show us the temporal changes of the water cycle, which are different in each country. But overall, you can see that Earth's water is always in movement and it changes state between liquid, vapor, and ice. And the natural water cycle describes the continuous movement on, above, and below the surface of the Earth between the ocean and the seas, the atmosphere, the different highs, the lakes and the rivers, and the vegetation and the underground. Basically, water is everywhere, but we don't often see it. It's available in different forms. No, how is this water distributed? Well, the water quantity on Earth hasn't changed for millions of years, but its distribution in different reservoirs constantly change. So water is available in large quantities on Earth. It covers 70% of the Earth's surface. That's also why we call it the blue planet. However, 96.5% is salt water that is stored in the ocean and the seas. And that only leaves 2.5% of all available water as fresh water. And so if you're wondering difference between salt and fresh water, fresh water is the one you can drink and the one we can use is in most of our processes. So only a tiny portion of this fresh water is directly available for human use because some of it is locked in glacier or is in really deep aquifer. So it leaves only this tiny portion of uh, that you can see on the graph, only 1% of total water on Earth is available for 8 billion people, plus all the other living species and ecosystem that rely on it. And so the, the, the water that we see in our lakes and river, which is usually, usually the one we come across the more often, is only 0.23% of all the fresh water available on Earth. So just to give you some proportion before we start talking about the challenges. So now that we understand where the water is and how much we have available, which is not much, it's important to understand the connection between human activities and the water challenges. So there are four activities that directly use or consume water. Uh, we have agriculture, municipalities, which will be uh, household, but also school, hospitals. We have industries and the energy sector. When we talk about water usage, we have 
the difference between water use and water consumption. So water use is when we, or water withdrawal, is when we take the water from one ecosystem and we put it back into that same ecosystem within a short period of time. And the contrary, water consumption is when we take the water from one ecosystem, but we don't give it back to that same ecosystem. Um, that could be the case, for example, with agriculture, when we irrigate crops, this water may be absorbed by the plants and evapotranspirates it back to the atmosphere. So it's not going to go back to the rivers where it's been taken for irrigation. So we will account it as a consumed water. In going back to the human activities, there are four other activities that impact the water cycle. Um, we have deforestation, we have urbanization and land use planning, and transportation. So we'll look in the next five minutes at how those activities have impacted the water cycle and are driving many of the water challenges that we are facing today. So the first one is the soil and the vegetable cover modification. So human activities like intensive agriculture, but also urban development and industrialization have significantly changed the natural vegetable cover. This means that we have either reduced or completely removed plant life from certain areas. For instance, 80% of deforestation is a result of intensive agriculture, uh, in particular, the meat and dairy industries. So trees are cut down and they are burned to make way um, for large monoculture fields or cattle pasture, as you can see it. And this is happening in Australia still. Uh, WDBF recently published um, a scoring system to show which state is uh, the worst in terms of deforestation and New South Wales is the worst at the moment. Then we have also um, the soil that is left bare between crops due to the tilling with tractors. Um, pesticides are sprayed on the land as well, which deplete the previous vegetable cover and reduce the soil ability to retain water. In urban areas, we have construct constructed concrete cities that prevent water from infiltrating into the soil and plants. So instead, rainwater is quickly flushed away through gutters and water treatment system. And even though we can spot small patches of greens in our concrete city, they are often struggling to survive um, in this uh, quite intense urban landscape, which is growing everywhere in the world as well. And then we have also industrialization, which demands space for warehouse, transport infrastructure and power plants, which lead to the development of such facilities on lands that was once rich in soil and vegetation cover. So you can see on the, on the slide a screenshot of um, Western Sydney between 1986 and 2022 and see how much we have built on land that used to be vegetation. Um, so that's definitely one of the main driver of uh, the loss of vegetable cover in the world. So as a result of that, uh, streams have been drained, soils are depleted and eroded, um, and studies show that uh, one third of the earth's soils are already degraded and we could lose up to 90% of it by 2050 if we continue to develop the way we've done so far. And so the modification of the soil and the vegetable chain cover is directly modifying the water cycle by altering precipitation, evaporation, runoff, and infiltration processes. So to understand how, um, we will explore the fascinating, but also the complex system of trees. And I will try to make it simple because we don't have time and we could speak for hours about the role of trees. But to summarize it, trees act as a giant net capturing atmospheric moisture and nutrients through their vast surface area. So the trunk of the tree, the needle, the leaves, and the air flowing through them. Um, so we have moisture, air particle, but also pollen that are collected on each millimeter of the tree surface. When the tree condenses the water, so when it transforms it from um, vapor to liquid, the water will slowly drip down to the soil, which will contribute to the local precipitation in forest. So when it rains, trees will intercept and slow down the raindrops, directing them below their canopy, where the intercepted water, but also the nutrient, will enrich the soil. And so the trees also absorb the waters through their roots, and a tree is approximately 50% water. Um, as us humans, we are approximately 60% water. And in the Amazon rainforest, 75% um, of the water is returned to the atmosphere thanks to the vegetation. So trees not only 
attract the water down to their root system, but they also evat- evapotranspirate water to the atmosphere. And so human activities like deforestation disrupt this intricate system. So when forests are replaced with concrete lands, the water regulation system breaks down, which results in reduced rainfall on bare lands and also um, increased floods when rainfall uh, comes through. And this is also worsened by climate change. I'm not even uh, entering into climate change impact here. So vegetation and trees are definitely fundamental to our water resources, and they collaborate with the atmosphere to produce rain and maintain a delicate balance. And so here you can see uh, consequences of removing trees and vegetation on the left in cities where we have uh, put a lot of concrete and on the right uh, on the on the land where we use intensive agricultural practices and the soil is totally eroded. Another impact of our activities is water withdrawal. So water is essential for all activities. I think all of us will relate to um, the water we can see around us in all the goods that we use. But as we've seen before, only 1% of the Earth's total water is directly available for consumption. Um, And despite no increase in water available um, over the past 200 years, freshwater withdrawal and consumption have doubled compared to population growth, which is what you can see on the graph. Uh, So consequently, we have developed infrastructure to extract the water from deeper aquifer, or we have built dams so that we can meet urban demand uh, for water supply. But those practices have consequences. Uh, So here it's an example of Mexico City, where dry condition and overpumping of the aquifers when they develop the city are now causing the city to sink up to 50 centimeters per year due to the weakening of the clay lake bed. Um, We also have chemical constituents and pollutants that flow downward into the aquifer, which further decrease the water quality. This is one example uh, amongst 100 others where having uh, dried up the aquifer is uh, then having consequences on on the land and then on people as well. Then another um, impact of the previous uh, changes that I mentioned is the change to our waterways. So by installing more and more dams or also bridges and levees to uh, create transports or to uh, create energy with um, hydropower plants, we have changed the way that water is naturally flowing into our environment. Um, We have also developed transport system that facilitate the trade and the travel across water, but is also disrupting the way water is flowing naturally through our ecosystem. And so a study by Nature showed that in Europe, out of the 14 great rivers that used to freely flow through the ecosystem and to the sea, only two of them remain untouched, two out of 14. Um, which show like the, the the impacts that our activities have had on water waterways and the way they they used to flow in the ecosystem. And the leading consequence of that and of what I've discussed in the previous slide is the loss of ecological continuity. So the ecological continuity is the free movement of sediments and water species along waterway. And so when we put things like uh, weirs and barrage and dams, we obstruct the migration of sediments and biodiversity um, through water bodies, which cause widespread ecological disruption. Um, so there are some examples here showing that in um, in New South Wales only, we can account for more than 5,000 physical barriers, but also reduction of sediment transport and decrease in water flow due to um, the installation of a dam in Africa. Uh, just to add on top, like it's, as I said, it's quite, don't be quite full on, on in terms of water challenges, just to show you the complexity of water system and our, the interaction we have with them. So another threat to our water supply is water pollution. Uh, we have contaminants that flow into waterways as a byproduct of manufacturing, farming, manuf- and general human living uh, through our wastewater system. And we have marine transport also that discharge pollutant into the ocean. We will all have seen images of boats just leaking their um, their oil into the the ocean. Uh, We also have cars that leave oil on the road. And all of that is carried away when when rain falls and is impacting uh, waterways and the water quality. Um, In the United States, 
it's accounted that 40% of the rivers and 46% of lakes are polluted to a stage that they are not suitable for fishing, swimming, and any other activities. And that happened only in the last 100 years. And so to finish, um, one impact that is a consequence of all the other ones we've seen is the loss of biodiversity. Uh, it's linked to the destruction of their habitats, waterways development, the rise of invasive species, overfishing, pollution, and climate change. But here, if we just focus on what we've seen before, obviously by um, the changes we've made to waterways or the pollution or their over the overuse of some uh, water system, we have totally disrupted freshwater ecosystem and, and also ocean ecosystem. And some numbers here are, are given uh, overall, we have an 80% decline of freshwater species population size since 1970. And uh, we have lost up to almost 90% of wetlands since um, the, the year 1700. So just show how dramatic the loss of ecosystem of freshwater ecosystem um, has been in only a couple of hundred years. And so as seen in the previous section, the water crisis presents a lot of environmental and socioeconomic challenges. Um, I haven't, I've not even had a chance to talk about the impacts of climate change here because it will require another hours. Uh, but to summarize, we have freshwater ecosystems that are deteriorated, species population that collapse. We have wetlands that are disappearing faster than forests. Um, sanitation uh, remain also limited in many areas. And the increasing demand for limited water resources leaves major cities on the brink of running dry. At the moment in France, there are 700 villages that are relying on tank to get their water supply due to the drought that has been happening in the last few years. And so that's where the United Nations Water Sustainable Development Goals come in with three pillars, which are the water availability, quality, and accessibility. Because by addressing this pillars and embracing sustainable practices, we can steer ourselves towards a future where water scarcity becomes a thing of the past. And so that's where I want to focus on the last uh, five minutes is on how we can reverse some of the damages that I've presented by working with nature. And so that's the, um, the goal of regenerative hydrology practices. Uh, so hydrological regeneration, which is also um, named regenerative hydrology, refers to the restoration and the improvement of natural hydrological cycle in an ecosystem. So making sure that we, um, we have small water cycles that are resilient and that are working as they should do. So it, in, it involves implementing practices and strategies to enhance water infiltration water storage and retention in the landscape. So we want to avoid having water just uh, running off to, to the ocean directly as soon as it falls on the land. So in hydrological regeneration, we make efforts to mimic the uh, natural processes of water flow and its distribution and storage, which would have been disrupted by human activities. And so by restoring this balance, this hydrological balance, we would increase the resilience of ecosystem, enhance the groundwater recharge, reduce the risk of flooding and droughts, and promote the health and biodiversity of aquatic and terrestrial habitat as well. So it will lead to a lot of positive social and health benefit as well for the communities that drive that regeneration. So there is also a, a social and human benefit to it. So let's review some example of um, regeneration practices. We have uh, reforestation, rainwater harvesting practices, natural sequence farming, um, all um, new way of doing agriculture, uh, regenerative agriculture, but also agroforestry and agroecology. And then we have also blue and green infrastructure for urban environments and wetland restoration. So. If we um, look at one project that is quite famous in Australia, it's led by the non-profit Mullen Institute, which is leading the charge to inform farming communities of the benefit to land and producti productivity that um, hydrological regeneration brings. So they have been leading the Mullen Rehydration Initiatives, which is restoring 50 kilometers of the Mullen Creek, running through 23 properties um, in New South Wales. 
So if, if we look at the before and after, you can see some of the impacts, positive impacts that it had on the ecosystem and the environment where they've been uh, leading that project. And on top of that, they have also tried to bring together the community with a bringing the community along approach to make sure that all stakeholders um, are engaged with the project. Then another uh, famous project that start to happen uh, around the world is the river daylighting, where um, we uncover rivers that that have been covered by concrete uh, due to urbanization, and we just remove all the concrete and we restore the rivers to the way it used to be. So that's an example of um, a river daylighting project in New Zealand, but there are hundreds of them in the UK as well, and um, and like more and more case studies showing the positive benefit it has on the social um, environment as well, because people come back to those rivers to to gather, and so it also it can also increase. Uh, the economic return of the place where those projects happen. And finally, something you may be more familiar with or you have seen happening more and more is the blue and green infrastructure. Uh, so things like draining pavements, green roof or vegetalized trenches to try again to retain the water in the ecosystem using vegetation. So to conclude, um, simple message would be that every drop of water matters, and it's totally possible to restore the damages done to the water cycle by adopting principles that we saw before, which include the water, the vegetation, the soil, and also humans working together. And even if you think that you don't influence, you don't have an influence over this action, you can start by measuring your own water footprint um, and start understanding where is water hidden in your daily consumption habits. And one important thing that we can all do is just ask the toss question to, to your local council or to your suppliers to understand where is water coming from and how it is being uh, treated. Because yeah, water is life. So without it, we won't go really far. Yeah, thank you for your attention.